For the last few weeks, Pastor Barry brilliantly taught on the big story, but he also looked at the three battlegrounds of our mind, our mouth, and our emotions. And if you haven't watched them, you can go on to lifecenter.org. They've been uploaded this week. They're there. And I encourage you to do so, to keep tracking with this series. They were brilliant. The next two weeks, we're going to take a deeper dive, though, into discussing spiritual conflict by looking at authority, the topic of authority. So let's do that now. Our culture has taken a strongly inward turn. You know, while all cultures have stressed the importance of community and the need to forge a personal identity that negotiates and aligns with the common good, that means with others, modernity, which is the way in which the world, especially North America, finds itself today, both modern and postmodern, it's just lumped under this word of modernity, stresses looking inward to forge one's own identity based on personal desires. And then what we do then is we move outward to demand that our society honors our individual identity and our individual interests. So this is Philip Reif and Charles Taylor. They are sociologists looking from a 30,000-foot perspective that this is now the world in which you and I find ourselves in. And so as a result of this understanding, North America, from a sociological perspective, authority is now closely aligned by some version of a self-defined identity. Nobody knows me better than I know myself, so I am the best way to know who I am. No one knows me like me, therefore, and then you can fill in that blank with many different things. But here's the challenge. Once again, Matthew Smethurst, I've made this, this quote a couple of times, the world says that your main problem is outside of you, and it's getting the world to behave in accordance with who you are, and the solution is within you. The challenge, though, is that's not the gospel that Jesus taught, preached, lived. What Jesus said is that your main problem is actually within you, and that the solution is outside of you, that we need saving, we need sanctifying, that we need the power of the Holy Spirit that is outside of us to come dwell on the inside of us and transform us to be more like Jesus. So we don't look inside of ourselves for truth. We look to Christ. We look to God's word for truth, best evident in the person of Jesus Christ. And then from outside, we invite Jesus to live, rule, and reign in our heart. The power of the Holy Spirit dwells in our heart. And so again, these two things, these two ways in which we identify our lives are in direct conflict in the world in which you and I live. The self-determination of truth, therefore, coupled with all of us have a need to belong is creating this increasingly heavy weight for many people to carry. Partly because what I just articulated is rife with contradiction, but it's also this ever-shifting target of constantly proving that we are good enough to belong in today's world. If you look at those who are under the age of 19, we have historically not seen levels of anxiety the way in which that we are seeing. One of the reasons of this, it's not the whole reason, it's not the magic bullet, but one of the reasons is the gospel sets us free from earning salvation, but when you live in this world, everything is earned. Your acceptance is earned. Your belonging is earned. And it's an ever-shifting target of knowing just not what the right thing is to believe, but how do I even say it? And this is important. I'm not minimizing it. However, the level of stress and anxiety that people are under is extensive. Now, nowhere do I desire to diminish the power of being authentically who you are. Jesus himself clearly warned us about being hypocritical or judging others outside of the faith. But here's what I'm addressing, or here's what we're diving into today. Who you are places an emphasis on authenticity. Are you being honest about who you are? But following Jesus asks an entirely different question other than who you are. Jesus... And by extension, all of darkness, Satan and every demonic force, doesn't care as much about who you are as whose you are. It's not pitting these questions against each other. They are just entirely different important questions. One leads to authenticity. Whose you are is a question of authority. Who you are, again is authenticity, and whose you are is authority. Authenticity is all about your personhood. That is your gender, your sexuality, your your ethnicity, your personality, your spiritual gifts, your natural abilities, your acquired skills, the job that you have. All of those things are your personhood, and they're valid, and they're important. But authority 
is not about any of those things. Authority is about position. And for Jesus, there are only two positions, in or outside of Christ. That's it. Kingdom of light, kingdom of darkness. You're in Christ or you're outside of Christ. Jesus said it this way. You either found or you're lost. There's a lot of different ways that you can be lost. But Jesus said there's only one way that you can be found, and that's by him. Lots of ways that we can be lost. We can be actually successfully lost or unsuccessfully lost. We can be emotionally healthy and still lost and emotionally unhealthy and lost. We can be a really nice person and lost, or we can be a horrible person and we can be lost. Lots of different ways we can be lost. There's only one way that we can be found, and that is in Christ, and that is positional, not personhood. Yes, it affects those things, but how many of you know that when you gave your life to Jesus, it didn't change your personality? You are who you still are. If you're an introvert, you may even still be introverted. I didn't, didn't change my personality, right? These are important things for you and I to look at. So again, as Pastor Barry shared so well, in particular when he did the big story, since the beginning of humanity, humans have always wanted all the gifts of God. We just don't want God. We want to be our own gods. This is rebellion. This is authority. This is what we do when we sin. We have, again, we've got a lot of nice words for sin, like I made a mistake, I fell, it was an oops. But really what it is, is I want to be the own king of my kingdom, queen of my kingdom. I want to rule my own life. I'm in rebellion. God, I don't need you to be God in this area. I got it. I can be my own God. This is the same deception in Genesis chapter 1, and it's the same thing happens to all of humanity, all throughout, or beyond, I should say, Genesis chapter 2, verses 3, or chapters 2 and 3, not chapter 1. Chapter 1, everything was good, and then it went downhill from there. So being authentically yourself, but not in Christ, and therefore trying to do the works of God without God is an entirely risky proposition, as we're now going to see in the story that we're going to anchor in today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn or tap to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, there is a troubling story showing us how critical authority is. So we're not talking about authenticity. That's an important conversation, but it's a different one. We're talking about whose you are. Again, whether you're here, at home. Whose you are, we're talking about authority today. In Acts chapter 19, here's what's also really important to note. Though it happened, if this story that we're about to read, though it happened a few thousand years ago in a different cultural context, so those things are true, here's what is identical to today. In Acts chapter 19, Acts comes after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in your Bible. Okay, after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John comes Acts. And so what I'm saying that is this is after the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So they are living in the last days like we are living in the last days. So the story that we're about to read if we read an Old Testament story, it maybe have, it's, what you're reading is something that happened under a different covenant. What we are reading today is happening under the same covenant, the same power that we have in the Holy Spirit. And so it's important for us to look at what is occurring here. One second. I have vacation voice. I need to get back preaching voice. Takes a little bit of time. In Acts chapter 19, here it is in verses 13 to 16, before I read, it says this. There's a, just a little bit of a backdrop. There's a high priest, a high priest sorry, named Sceva who has seven sons. Uh, these sons grow up around religion, okay? So here's what's critical. Proximity to does not equate in Christ to position in. Proximity to does not equate to position in. So here's what, why that's important to note. You can be, grow up in church, all around church, know all the lingo, all the customs, every which way. You can get the church culture down to a T. Proximity to does not change position in. You are in Christ or you are outside of Christ. You can sing every song, you can quote every scripture, but you can actually never surrender your heart to Jesus. So here you can see it here in this text here. They've grown up all around religion and it's going to be very evident. The, their identity, though, is they are sons who are outside of Christ. Though their father is a priest, they're outside of, they're outside of Christ. They've never surrendered their life, life to Christ. Therefore, they're lost. And mistakenly, here's what they do. They believe that authority is saying the right words, the right formula, or using the right name. That's what they believe spiritual authority is. If I have the right formula, the right words, and I use the right name, that's what spiritual authority is. A little example here that what I would, I would just kind of use is you can know my name. Uh, you can know which car is ours, Lori and mine in the parking lot. There's a little white Jeep out there. You can know which one is ours. Um, 
But if you don't have our authority to take it, and after service, you just decide to take it, you know, because the Lord told you to. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> right? You, you just take it. Here's what I want. That's, that's something called theft. You're not allowed to just do that because you felt like, I felt very strongly, though, that I could do that. The law, the law doesn't care about your feelings. You've stolen something that doesn't belong to you. Now, if one of my kids walk out there, and they don't even tell mom and dad, not at all, and they take it, I'm going to be upset as a father. Like, I'm going to be pretty perturbed as I drive home. Lori and I are you know, get, getting a ride home on the white and red limousine. We're going to be perturbed. That's the OC Transpo, if you didn't figure that out. But we're going to be a little perturbed. But how many of you know their position in our lives is different than your position in our lives? So positionally, they're, now it's still not a good thing for them to do. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying because of their different position, though it may have been immature in how they did it, there's going to be an entirely different response to it. Okay? That's a good little, a little illustration for understanding position. When Jesus ministered, what was the common reaction from people? It was that he was ministering as one who had two things, authority and power and not just like teachers of the law. Now let's get to Acts 19, verse 13 to 16. It says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists... Now that is a job title you want on a business card. Okay? <laughs> some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. So pause there really briefly as we're reading this. There's more than one way to take the Lord's name in vain. Okay? Taking the Lord's name in vain isn't just cursing. It's using his name just for your benefit, but not in accordance to his word. So he invokes the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So there are people then who had evil spirits. There are people today who are oppressed or possessed, which is just the Bible uses one word, which is demonized, who are absolutely under the influence or influenced in their areas of their lives by evil spirits. And here's what these seven sons said. I adjure you by the Jesus. Everyone say right name. They got the name right. I adjure you by the Jesus. Now, if you ever have to use the word the in front of the person, like if I said to you, there's the Lori, like that should show that I don't have a great depth of relationship. So I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. I adjure you by a really powerful name that I've seen Paul using that I've heard. So they're talking now not to out here. They're talking to an evil spirit. I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now the scripture turns frightening. It says, but the evil spirit answered them. Ooh. Ooh, as Pastor Lori said when she got up here, we're talking about the unseen realm. This isn't unseen. There's now a conversation taking place. The evil spirit answered them. Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize. Paul, I recognize his authority positioned in Christ. This is what the spirit, the evil spirit said back. Here's the frightening question. But who are you? Directly translated. By whose are you? Understood for us today. In whose authority are you addressing us? The seven sons can't stand up and say, well, this is my personality. I, this is the guy. I took the Enneagram test and it turns out, it turns out that I'm a three with a four wing. Or this is my personality, or this is my gender, or this is my ethnicity. Notice that the spirit world doesn't respond to anything in terms to authenticity that are important things. It only understands authority. It only understands authority. In whose authority are you telling us to do something? In whose authority are you trying to supersede? Listen, in whose authority are you trying to supersede the authority that we have to be here? That's what's happening here in the story. And it says, 
The man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, so they all fled out of that house naked and wounded. That is not a good day if you're an itinerant Jewish exorcist. That's a bad, bad, bad day. Now, they had, these seven sons had the right name, they had the right formula, they used the right words, but there was no authority. Why? Because they were not positioned in Christ. Church, I don't care how charismatic somebody looks, that doesn't mean they have spiritual authority. It doesn't matter how boisterous their gifts might be, that doesn't mean they have spiritual authority. Oftentimes, we minister with our personality. And some people have really big personalities, and some people have really small personalities, and some of y'all have no personalities. That was a joke. That was just a joke. But we often equate power with personality. How big it is or how charismatic it is. Here's what I want you to know. You can have the quietest personality. You can have the most shy demeanor. You can be the world's biggest introvert positioned in Christ. All of hell quakes when you say in Jesus' name. Amen. Church. Much of what we see around this area is personality driven. Don't get drawn to personality that's rooted in the authority and power and who we are in Christ. It's not how powerful the experience was. It is how positioned we are in Jesus. This is what is of ultimate importance. See, the end result of this story is the exact opposite of what you see in Jesus. And it's heartbreaking. Because these seven sons, these seven sons of Sceva show up wanting to do the works of God without surrendering and submitting to God. They want the gifts of God. They just don't want God. And it's devastating because the man who was literally demonized in this story, he leaves after this encounter the exact same way they found him. It's, it's horrible. And then worse than that, in the story that we just read, the very thing that we desire to see, which is the kingdom of light invading the kingdom of darkness, it's the reverse. Once again, these seven sons are now absolutely humiliated, humiliated because of what they tried to do outside of the authority that they had in Christ. It's the exact opposite. Instead of the demons being driven out, these seven sons are driven out, humiliated, they're wounded. The one who's demonized isn't set free. And darkness expands. But here's what I want you to know. Everywhere darkness expands and everywhere there's the counterfeit, you can absolutely rest assured that there's the authentic, there's the genuine of God moving. So in this story, here's what happens. As the people then begin to see there's something different, how Paul lives his life, positioned in Christ. There's a uniqueness to his gospel, his singular gospel he's preaching, compared to the religious world around us, which once again was the same thing that they saw in Jesus. Jesus, you're different than religious teachers of the law. You teach with power and you teach with authority because he was the son of God positioned in, you know, in Christ, or he was Christ positioned in God. Okay. Reading Acts 17, uh, 19, 17 to 20. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And it says that fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. And many of those who were now believers, ah, watch this, now believers, not unbelievers, believers. So believers who were positioned in Christ realized, uh-oh, I'm engaging in horoscopes. I'm engaging in all these different types of things, trying to figure out my future rather than trusting God with my future. I'm trying to figure out and control all these things. Ah, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, here, but that's what they were doing. This Now the believers came confessing, and they were divulging their practices. And a number of them who had practiced magic arts, there is power in darkness. There's power in the demonic realm. There's absolutely, it's counterfeit things, but it's powerful. You can do stuff. They see this. It's they brought their books together and they burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them. And it came to about 50,000 pieces of silver, which in our language or our dollars today, they brought all these things. It was about $6 million worth of material. That's a move of God. 
where people begin to say, okay, they can see the contrast. There's no life in this. There's no truth in this. There's no freedom in this. So I don't want this. What I want is the gospel. What I want is Jesus. What I want to live with is the same power and authority that Jesus had that I can see in the apostles. This is what's going on. Because in the Bible, power and authority are always interconnected. Power is this word called dunamis which we see 118 times in the New Testament. Exousia is this word authority, or authoria is exousia. And authority is interesting. We see again 108 times in the New Testament, but authority always relates to people. Power of God, so the power of God is the power that Jesus gives us as his sons and his daughters. Authority, though, refers to the right use of this power in accordance to the character of Christ. Authority is the right that we have to steward the power that God gives us in the character of Christ. It's important. So both power and authority flow from the finished work of Jesus, and they are empowered in us by the Holy Spirit. But here's the key word. The key word here is steward. Everyone say steward. You're a steward. It's, it's not an owner. It's not my power. It's God's power. I am just called to steward. Oftentimes you and I think of stewardship only in a financial sense. It's not. Stewardship is the entire posture of us as followers of Jesus. That all that we have is a gift from God. Our salvation is a gift. Our spiritual gifts are gifts. That's why they're called spiritual gifts. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, forget it. Everything that we have in our lives is this gift that we're called to steward. And it's not for our glory, it's for the glory of God. Charles Kraft says then, our authority then is this God-given right to receive and use God's power that flows from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So authority has really nothing to do with authenticity or with our personhood. That's an important conversation, but it has nothing to do with authority. Authority is us being rooted in Christ alone as members of God's family. Jesus told a parable regarding talents that we receive where his main point was stewardship. And regarding what we see, receive, this includes receiving power and authority. Jesus brought four points of clarity that I'm going to end with, not unpack them because they're pretty self-explanatory. The first thing is this. God's authority doesn't belong to us. It is his and we are entrusted with it. Therefore, we must use it rightly for the purposes for which it was given. Our culture, our culture is correct to both call out and hold the church of Jesus Christ accountable when we individually or as a church misuse authority or misuse power. I'm going to say it again. Our culture is both correct to call out and to hold us accountable when we as individuals or the church misuse authority or misuse power. And so, Lord, give us humility to receive correction when we've used your name, your power, and your authority in ways that were self-serving but not Christ-honoring. And that can be true of my life, that can be true of your life, that can be true of a church, and that can also be true of his church. God's authority never gives us the right to command God to do our will. God's authority never gives us the right to command God to do our will. Jesus said he only did that which he saw the Father doing. So positioned, relationally connected to the Father, he does what he sees the Father doing. I want to say this with love. I want to say this with love. I want to say this with love. We must be extremely mindful when we are naming and claiming, decreeing and declaring in Jesus' name that we are actually in accordance with God's word. Here's all I know. As Katia said as she was leading us in worship a few moments ago, his ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts, higher than my thoughts. There have been some seasons that God has brought me through that I would never have chosen for myself. But there was gold in the season that only God could give. There was refining in the season that only the season could provide. And so sometimes we have to be careful that we're not trying to name and claim and decree and declare something that God is leading us through 
that we wanted to go like in a different direction. Like, I, I, you know, Lord, I, wouldn't it be great if every marriage could just say, like, cut out all the bad stuff? Like, you know, we say for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Like, wouldn't it be great if it was just like for richer, for healthy, for like, just, you know? It would be great. The only problem is it wouldn't be real life at all. No, the heart of covenantal love is whether it's in richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, whether a life hits the mountaintop or whether it bottoms out, the covenant is going to hold. And that's what gives us security within it. Okay, so God's authority never gives us the right to command God to do our will. So we've got to be really mindful when we're naming and claiming, decreeing and declaring in Jesus' name. We've got to be really, really mindful that it's in accordance with God's word and the character of Christ. The other piece is that God's authority never makes us indispensable. Has anybody here ever been in... It's, okay, this question. Has anybody here, ever have a jo- anybody here at, you're at home ever had a job? Can I see your hands, please? Okay. Some of you have not had jobs yet. Okay, it means really go low. And I mean a job like you had, even if you were given chores at home, that was a job. Can I see everyone's hand, please? Okay. Because this has happened. This has happened to you as a kid. If you've ever had, if you ever had a sibling and your parents said these words, your sibling is in charge, you were in trouble. For some of you. Has anybody here ever had a job and you have an amazing coworker but all of a sudden, your coworker gets a different title and they turn into a different person. <laughs> Church, our position and authority that we have in Christ is designed to make us look and love and serve more like Jesus. And that doesn't mean that we don't have roles and positions that we need to step into. But if your picture of authority on earth is CEO and not chief servant, then I want to call you to a biblical model of leadership, a biblical model of what it is to love and serve one another. So God's authority never makes us indispensable. We all embrace that we have a single race to run. You're running a race. You're running a race. You're running a race. I'm running a race. Yet we must all equally own that we are running an interconnected race. If the last 19 months has not shown us and taught us this, that we as the human race are far more interconnected than we actually realize, then I don't know if we're getting it. We must all equally own that we are running an interconnected race. And so here's what I want you to know. How you steward what God gives you matters not only to you, but it matters to others. Could you imagine the story that we read if these seven sons would have surrendered their hearts to Jesus have they, if they had not just been religious, but relationally connected to Christ. Oh, the difference this story could have been. And you can just look to the right or to the left to look at the life of Paul, to look at someone who was not just religious, but relationally connected in Christ and the difference that his life made in this story. Oh, it could have been so very different. So how you steward what God gives you matters, not only to you, but it matters to others. How we steward the church that God entrusts to us matters, not only for you, but for the next generation. We have a great cloud of witnesses who have already run their race, cheering us on as they were faithful to run their race. And so the scripture says in closing, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power, there's the word, of the enemy, and nothing shall harm you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in this, that the evil spirits or the spirits are subject to you. Don't rejoice that you can see the power of God working in your life. But Jesus says to us, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And in other words, rejoice in your positional standing in Christ. Rejoice in what God has done for you, which if your name is written in heaven, it is the one thing that you cannot do for yourself. It is something that only Jesus can do. And so Jesus is saying, don't rejoice in the outflow of a life in 
Christ. That should be commonplace for followers of Jesus. Rejoice in your position as sons and daughters of the King, sons and daughters of the Most High. Rejoice in who you are positionally. Don't define your life in the power of what you see, but in the person of who you are in Christ. Because that's where your authority comes from, not from your authority in titles and all of these things. That gives us earthly power or earthly positional authority. But our genuine authority that we have in Christ is not how big, it's not how bold we are. It is how secure we are in Christ. And in Christ, we are either lost or we are found. That's it. Amen? What Jesus is saying to each of us here plainly and clearly is, I have given you authority, but the right to use this power is also vital. You know, rejoice not in what you do. Rejoice in whose you are. Living an authentic life is important, but understanding the authority that you have as a son or daughter in Christ is absolutely vital. Together, let's stand. That scripture that I just read in Luke 10, verse 19 to 20, is our prayer scripture as we're walking this week, saying, Lord, you're welcome here. This is what we're praying, and our prayer point is to pray for those who have authority, earthly authority. That could be parents and spiritual leaders, workplace, law enforcement, government leaders, whatever you happen to be. You just only have to open your eyes a little bit to see that we're struggling with all types of authority today. And so we need to be praying for those who are in authority, that they would have wisdom, guidance, and that they'd be godly leaders or have godly leadership. This is something that we could all intercede and pray for this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that if we're lost in this very moment, that you're as close as the mention of your name, that you are one moment of surrender, that if we would trust that we need saving, that we cannot define ultimate truth by looking inward, that we need to look inward to see, yeah, who we are. But Father, when we do that, we also see sin and brokenness and error and rebellion. And so, Father, we either have now two paths. We try to fix ourselves, which is religion or modernity. We try to make ourselves better. Or we can actually admit that we're sinners in need of saving, that we are broken in need of healing, that we are lost in need of being found. And so, Holy Spirit, would you get a hold of hearts in a way that only you can do? And for those of us who are found, Father, with whatever giver of power or authority that you've entrusted to us, Lord, may it not go to our heads, but may it go from our hearts to our hands as we serve others. Father, make us humble when we need to receive correction from how we've misused your power or your authority. And Jesus, may we be the quickest church in the world to confess so that we can become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.